ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, lovely to be here. My name's Sarah Montague. I normally uh, present the Today programme on Radio 4, so I hope you know the voice, if not the face. Now, uh, this is normally way past my bedtime, but I couldn't resist the invitation to chair a, a topic like this. UKIP, the radical right, and the European Parliament elections. We have very much the man of the moment here um, to... to to listen to and to, to and to ask questions of in a little bit, um, because we are we're going to talk about that for the next hour. Keep an eye on my watch. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we we kick off. Um, Chatham House rules do not apply here. This is on the record. It's being live streamed on the web. Um, you can comment or ask questions via Twitter, of course, obviously. A uh, couple of hashtags. Ask questions using uh, hashtag AskCH. I'll keep a bit of an eye on that, uh, but really, actually, guess what? The old-fashioned thing of putting your hand up is going to be far superior. I'm more likely to keep an eye on that. Um, but if you want to make a comment or ask a question, do use that hashtag AskCH, or indeed, there's another one I've got here, hashtag CH events, but I, I'm going to direct you to the AskCH if I can. Uh, apparently, you can email questions. I'm guessing this is for you who are... Uh, this is the live streaming. Questions at chathamhouse.org for comments. I'm not following, uh, my, following that, that's for sure. Um, phones are on silent, rather obviously. Um, let me introduce our speakers who we're going to hear from the next hour. Um, first of all, Joe Twyman. Now, Joe's our, he's our polling man. He's director of polling research at YouGov, uh, and we're going to hear from him in a few minutes. Um, Dr. Matthew Goodwin is Associate Fellow of Europe at Chatham House, and he's just written a book, this book you've been reading, I'm sure you've read about uh, over the last week or so, Revolt on the Right, Explaining Support for the Radical Right in Britain. Um, Nigel Farage, you all, all know, is the leader of UKIP. Um, and Laura Sands is a Conservative MP and convener of Europe Mainstream, uh, a pro-European Conservative. Must be rather jealous of the publicity that Nigel Farage gets uh, uh, for his, his position. Um, we're going to hear from each of them for please no more than sort of seven or eight minutes, um, less if possible, and then we'll open the floor for questions. And, and can we start with the polling, please? Joe Twyman, do you want to, to kick things off for us? Thank you. Uh... Excellent. It works. I'm going to talk very briefly then about the, uh, about the public opinion context of, uh, of what we're talking about today. And, of course, the... Uh, Perhaps the most important issue is, uh, is what is usually characterised as the rise of UKIP. And here it is. Here is the rise of UKIP that we've seen over the, uh, over the last few years. This goes back all the way to 2004. And you can see there are blips along the way associated with European elections mainly. But in recent years, the rise has become quite extraordinary. A rise from, uh, from the low single figures to, in our most recent polling, between 10 and 12%. And when you look at, uh, you look at performance, okay, oh, here we go. You look at things only over the last couple of years, and you can see that on our daily polling at YouGov, this really has, uh, this really has increased. And so uh, in the Westminster context, yes, there has certainly been, uh, been a rise in UKIP. And in Europe, the situation in Europe, the situation is similar. This was, uh, this was the result of the European election back in 2009. And this is our most recent polling result from the Sunday Times yesterday. If you look at those certain to vote, UKIP's rise is even higher. Uh, and we indeed expect that the most likely outcome of the European elections is that UKIP will win the most votes. And it's not, of course, just in Britain that this is uh, an issue we've seen across Europe. Anti-European or Eurosceptic parties gain in their, uh, in their support. Uh, now, there are a number of reasons, uh, reasons suggested for why this, is the, uh, why this is the case. I'll let you into a small secret. People generally don't understand the technicalities of Europe. Bit of advice there uh, <laughs> anyone. Uh, wanting political strategy. So uh, they don't really understand the technicalities, of, uh, the technicalities of Europe. Instead, they're interested in the broad narratives. And at YouGov, we've investigated the broad narratives across six different northern European countries, a whole, across a host of issues. I understand why the European Union exists. Well, a majority of people, 63% in Britain, agree with that. Uh, but when you, look at, uh, when you look at other things, other broad narratives, uh, your country gets a, um, 
gets a good deal from being a member of the European Union? Well, no country uh, has a majority that think that. Indeed, all things considered, the European Union is a good thing. Again, 38% of people agree with that. 30% of people disagree in Britain. A majority of no country thinks that. And when we ask life in the country surveyed would be better if it was not a member of the European Union, a relatively evenly spread result. Europe has not won the argument among its members. And perhaps part of the problem is this overwhelming belief that Europe needs significant reform. So you might conclude, even when you ask country, uh, the particular country will be a member of the European Union 20 years from now, even when you ask that and you see that actually there's a general belief that people do, want, do expect their country to stay, you might think, well, it's all about Europe. But I would suggest probably not, and we're going to talk about, about that in more detail. This is the historical data on whether people approve or disapprove of EU membership. And you'll notice it goes up and down. And when you compare that to UKIP's rise, you'll see that actually, in most recent years, it's, gone in, uh, it's broadly gone in the opposite direction. And Europe itself, when you ask what's the most important issue facing the country, you can see down at the bottom, really never resonates particularly highly. So the question is, what is it that's driving this? And, uh, and Matt and, uh, and his co-author co Rob look at this in more detail in their book, and I hope we'll talk about it today. But for me, it's to do with the three Ds. I think that UKIP has been particularly effective at mopping up and gearing up support from people who are dissatisfied, from people who are distrusting, and from people who are disapproving. These are the people who feel that things are moving on and they haven't offered consent for that. People who feel left behind by the process. And yes, it is often fair to characterize them as Eurosceptic, but the important bit of that is the skeptic part rather than the Euro part. I'm going to hand over to Matt now, who's going to talk about this in more detail. Yes. Dr. Matthew Goodling. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joe. What I'm going to do over the next eight minutes is summarise what uh, Rob Ford uh, and I have found in this book. And let me start by telling you why we wrote the book in the first place. Uh, UKIP is an exciting uh, political party and it's, it's, it's an exciting force and it's dominating our headlines. But it is incredibly misunderstood um, as a political party. We, we think we know what is behind UKIP. We are told constantly that this is primarily a revolt among middle class um, Eurosceptic conservatives that... This is about single-issue voters. It's about disgruntled Tories out in the countryside complaining about the European Union and distant Eurocrats in Brussels and Strasbourg. And we're told that actually if we just give these UKIP voters what they want, a referendum on Britain's uh, EU membership or perhaps lower immigration through a net migration cap, then UKIP will go away. So Rob and I sat down last summer and we just wanted to look at the data. Uh, and we started from this observation that actually everything that is written about UKIP is written in terms of the day-to-day -day conflicts in the Westminster village. This is about David Cameron and his support for equal marriage or his um, embrace of climate change or this is about what's happened since 2010. And we looked at data on UKIP support from 2004 to 2014, so a good 10-year sweep. But more than that, we looked at survey data in terms of British public opinion and social change going back to the 1960s. So, you know, our starting point here is that we're looking at UKIP in terms of how British society has changed over the long term. And that's when you begin to realize that the reality is very different. Nigel Farage and UKIP are actually tapping into who, who you might crudely term the left behind. Working class, low educated, financially struggling, uh, mainly white old men who look out at Britain and, to be honest, look at a country that they neither recognize nor feel that they want to be a part of. And they're not just animated by the single issue of Europe. These are voters who care intensely about a broader array of domestic concerns, immigration, the perceived unresponsiveness of Westminster elites. And that's one reason why Joe's chart has that nice disconnect between Europe as an important issue and levels of support uh, for UKIP. So we've tracked this long -term, uh, this, these long-term trends. And that shows us quite convincingly that actually UKIP's revolt on the right has been a long time coming and it has a long way to go. 
UKIP are really feeding off a very deep social division in our society. And in that respect, it's useful not to think of them as a political party, to think of UKIP instead as a symptom. They're telling us something about social divisions and value change in Britain. On the one hand, those with the skills, the education, and the qualifications to adapt and survive amidst a global post-industrial economy who got hit by the crisis but more or less had the skills to survive and move on versus the left behind who have a very different outlook, who not only got hit by Britain's economic transformation over the past three decades, but then got hit the hardest by the financial crisis and austerity. So UKIP are winning over more than one in 10 uh, Britons, but they're not the Britons that we think um, they are and, and, and are told so often um, who they are. In terms of their attitudes, these are voters who feel intensely distrustful of Westminster politics. They are very disconnected from our Westminster elite and incredibly anxious over immigration. If you like, their action in politics is ruled more by their heart than their head, and this is why I'm very skeptical of the notion that we can win them back by promising a referendum on Europe or by pledging net migration uh, caps on immigration, because these voters are already so distrustful. And we seem to be promising them action in areas where we actually have little control. And I suppose it's easy for the academic to say, but we've not necessarily been as honest and open with voters as perhaps we, we, we should have been in recent years. And UKIP are perhaps thriving um, off that. But the interesting thing, beyond all of that long-term social and value change that we uh, chart in the book, the interesting, interesting thing actually about UKIP from our perspective is more about the questions they raise for Labour than the Conservatives. Right now, today, UKIP are drawing most of their support from disillusioned Conservatives. But that wasn't always the case. We show that before 2010, more of UKIP's support came from disillusioned Labour voters. The point is that as a outsider populist party, they can thrive under very different political circumstances. I mean, think about it like this. Where would these voters be going if UKIP did not exist? <coughs> these are financially struggling, pessimistic, very disadvantaged Britons. Would they stay within the Conservatives? Well, arguably, they should be going to Labour. And instead, there's a sort of irony or a paradox in UKIP support here, that these are voters who have felt distinctly left behind by social change and feel cut out of our political conversation. And instead of moving behind a social democrat party, they're moving behind a radical right party that, you know, to, to, to be completely frank, isn't perhaps um, pushing as hard a protectionist line um, as, as, say, centre-left parties have. And as we saw in France over the last two days, when you can combine or tap into public opposition to immigration and economic insecurity, you can make a lot of gains in areas that are dominated by its centre-left parties, which is why Rob and I have been looking closely at the areas where UKIP tend to perform particularly well, or areas that have large concentrations of UKIP-friendly voters. We find that 19 of the 20 most UKIP-friendly seats in the country are held by Labour. Okay, so while the debate at the moment is framed very much in terms of what UKIP means for David Cameron and the Conservatives, if we take a step back and look at this through a long-term lens, of value and social changes in Britain that have cut off a left-behind electorate from our professional, middle-class, cosmopolitan, metropolitan elite that dominates our politics and media, we can begin to understand why some of the areas in the country that are most receptive to Nigel Farage and UKIP are actually not in Conservative hands. They're in the hands of the Labour Party, and that's why we argue that after 2015 there are some big questions uh, that may well face Ed Miliband. Um, that David Cameron is currently sweating over. So what do we do before I pass over uh, the floor? I mean, you know, luckily as academics, we don't need to worry about what you do in response to a party like UKIP, right? We're not really interested in the political consequences. We're just interested in understanding. But we would have a couple of uh, pieces of advice for all parties. I mean, firstly, you've got to recognize that the conventional wisdom here about UKIP is way off the mark. Are we going to have a serious conversation and debate about why these left-behind voters are moving behind UKIP? Or are we going to cling to this notion, this sort of outdated and, and wrong assertion that UKIP voters are just simply disillusioned conservatives? Are we going to look at this debate just in terms of what it means for 2015? Or are we going to look at this debate in terms of what it's telling us about the current direction and divisions within British society? So my starting point for any strategist would be, you know, look past 2015 go back to the 70s, trace this stuff over years, because this revolt has been a long time coming. With or without UKIP, it has a long way to go. And I think, secondly, if these voters are telling us anything, 
uh, on these issues. They're telling us that it's not just about economics. It's not just about financial contributions of migration or economic membership. And we saw this in the, the round one of um, uh, the Clegg and Farage debate, that Nick Clegg was very <coughs> adamant on making the uh, statistical case for EU membership. These voters hold a very different set of values from the professional middle class majority. They feel completely out of touch in, 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 uh, uh, from our Westminster elite, and they feel completely left behind. So how can we actually forge a genuine connection with their concerns over threats to the national community, as they see it, and threats to national identity that are not just about <coughs> financial contributions uh, of what they see around them? That's where I would start. We okay. can take this into uh, discussion. Matthew, Dr. Matthew Goodman, thanks very much. Um, Nigel Farage, your turn. Are you just a party for white old men? No, we just, uh, we, actually, I think what's interesting is the breadth of our support. You know, the fact is we've, we've, we've gone up in the polls rapidly, and what we're doing is we happen to be doing particularly well with that segment of the population. doesn't mean we're not picking up vote, uh, votes across the, the board, but this is, I mean, political parties like companies evolve. Uh, they change over time. Uh, but I begin by saying, I, you know, it's a good book. Um, it's the first analysis uh, that I've read of UKIP uh, that actually gets the history pretty much right uh, and chronicles the uh, ups and downs. Um, my only upset uh, with the book, um, although it's a good picture on the front of me in full, <laughs> full campaigning mode, is I'd been out campaigning in Eastleigh all day that day, and I really wish you hadn't chosen a picture that maybe look a bit like Robert Kilroy Silk in terms of colour. Um, what the fake tan? That wasn't fake, I promise you. Um, I, uh, what the book says is what I've been trying to tell people uh, in the commentary app for a very, very long time, but I've been just be completely wasting my breath. Uh, I used to think the problem was that the three political parties had all merged into one. They were all uh, differing brands of social democracy, so there's no point talking to them. But actually, we might get somewhere uh, with the newspapers and the commentators and the blogs, and actually, they're even more impervious uh, to, to genuine fact and, 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 and to understand change that is going on in this country. This book helps to set the record straight. You know, to read um, some of our conservative Cameroon uh, supporting newspapers, you know, you really would think that absolutely every voter for UKIP is a retired half colonel living on the edge of Salisbury Plain, who only perks up after the first pink gin of the day, um, desperate to bring back the birch, um, and absolutely hates Europe, um, and, hasn't, and hasn't been there since 1945. Well, <laughs> now, I mean, it's true. We're not doing badly with that market. <laughs> but there aren't many of them. Um, and I've been arguing, you know, it's been clear, I think, uh, for just over two years now to us in UKIP, um, that, that our real potential uh, is defined not by people's political background, but by their class. It's just as simple as that. And, and Paul Nuttall and I have known this, um, and, and the party has changed. You know, we started off as a party that really, uh, for most of the first 15 years, was a party that campaigned on constitutional issues. And I'm not backing away from those constitutional issues. You know, I still actually think that living in a parliamentary democracy is better than being a member of the European Union. Um, I still favour independence. Uh, I still think we'd be better uh, to forge our own trade deals across the rest of the world rather than rely on a Dutch bureaucrat who we can't vote for and we can't remove. None of that's changed. Uh, you know, and, and we will go on making those arguments. But uh, what has changed is... Uh, the language we use, the approach we use, uh, and the campaigning methods we use. And since I, since I came back as leader for the second time in uh, November 2010, after my brief period out of office and light aircraft incidents and all the rest of it, uh, and since I came back for the second time, I've been absolutely determined uh, to try and talk to people in language that they actually understand. <coughs> and I think we've done that, and we've had the opportunity in by-election after by-election in those big northern towns and cities uh, to be able to find out what works and to engage. I think there are three uh, real reasons why UKIP's doing well. I think the first is that we've made some pretty big calls and they've been proven in the minds of many people to be right. You know, I'm talking particularly about what happened in 2004 uh, with what I thought at the time was just madness to unconditionally open up the labour market 
uh, to people from countries very much poorer than us. Uh, you know, we're not protectionist. We want free trade. In fact, we think the EU is inhibiting in terms of what we can do globally. But we finished up with massive oversupply um, in our unskilled and semi-skilled labor markets uh, and uh, an immigration policy uh, that, n that, 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 that neither has control over quantity or quality. And I think people know we've said that. A lot of people know we've said that, know we've predicted it, um, and that is a, you know, a feather in our cap, as it were. Secondly, on the euro, you know, where we predicted doom um, and said that anyone that supports it must be an idiot, um, well, look at the Mediterranean um, and make your own minds up. So that's the first reason UKIP's doing well. We seem to have been ahead of the game and been right about things. The second reason we're doing well is, I think, with disenchantment, with the three established political parties is far greater actually than anybody, perhaps even this book, yet understands. Uh, there are just countless millions of people out there who, ha who have no interest in ever voting Labour or Conservative or perhaps now even Liberal Democrat again. So a very large number of people uh, floating around the system, uh, many of whom have quite willfully given up voting over the last couple of decades, looking for somewhere to go, uh, and I think looking for a politics uh, that actually says something. And one of the commonest responses I get um, out campaigning on the street from people is, well, Nigel, I don't agree with everything you say, but at least I understand what you stand for. Le le you know, at least I know where you are on issues. Um, so I think that second reason is absolute disenchantment with the professional career political class. Uh, and, and this idea, and, and Matthew mentioned it, this idea that all the Conservative Party have to do or the Labour Party have to do is to tweak this or tweak that and all the voters will go back to them is absolute nonsense. You know, they have completely lost faith. You know, if Cameron said, I'm holding a referendum next Thursday and you polled UKIP voters, I reckon 65% would say no chance. They just don't believe what they're being told anymore. Um, and I think the third reason that we're doing well is partly what I said in my introduction, the way we campaign. But it's the fact that people don't vote for UKIP because they want to leave the European Union. They vote for UKIP uh, understanding and knowing that's our position. That's, that, that is the prerequisite. They're voting UKIP because they see us addressing and talking about issues that are of real concern to them. Immigration being the top of the list. You know, and, and Cleggers can um, come out with whatever statistical figures he wants to come out with um, on Wednesday of this week. Um, this isn't about whether we have a couple of pips more on GDP. This is about a fundamental change that has happened to our communities, to our societies, and to the prospects of many of our, of our young people, and a feeling that something horribly has gone wrong. So they're the reasons, I think, that UKIP's connecting and doing well. OK. Thank you very much, Nigel Farage. Laura Sands. Thank you. Well, um, I've always come across Nigel in, in Kent. We uh, are both sort of from Kent. And my constituency had a, an interesting experience in the county elections. We lost uh, all our county councillors to UKIP county councillors. And I work very closely with them in trying to address local issues, etc. And so I have a lot of respect for people who vote UKIP. Um, that doesn't mean to say that I believe that the solutions or the approach is an approach that actually is A, sustainable, or B, actually really delivers. I totally agree about the three Ds, Joe, because I think the aspect of disaffection, of disappointment, and the sense of distrust is absolutely there. But in many ways, the UKIP appeal is also about a psychological and a values-driven appeal. And I think that I would criticize, in many ways, um, the traditional political parties for being transactional. I think Nigel said something very interesting a couple of weeks ago, and that was that it didn't matter that GDP didn't go up. And I think that we, the moderates, and I would call myself an extreme moderate, actually a fanatical centrist. Um, and I believe very strongly that it's down to us, actually, to make the case and not to allow simplistic, I and mean, you can accuse the traditional parties um, of presenting simplistic solutions to complex issues. And I think we do it far too often. But then when we start to look at what UKIP is promising, then I think we start to get beyond simplistic and into very, very uh, sort of top line, um, actually undeliverable uh, politics. So we've got sort of, with UKIP, the, the politics of the totem. 
EU, the EU, is it about the EU? Well, we've already discussed that. Actually, it's about lack of control. It's about people feeling they're not in control of their future. Now, the solutions there is not the EU. The solutions there is a wide range of policies, actually, some that reside very much in the Conservative Party, on absolutely turbocharging localism. The second thing is migration. Migration, immigration. Nigel does flip-flop a little bit here because sometimes we're talking about quality, sometimes we're talking about quantity, sometimes we're talking about EU, sometimes we're talking about beyond the EU. I, I'm not sure, I'm absolutely clear on the real details of what the migration policy is. But actually it's not about migration, per se, the anxiety of my constituents. It's about cost of living. It's about finding out why everything in my pocket, it goes less far than it did before. And the financial crisis has certainly thrown everyone's sense of, sh of surety and sense of end game. So I think we've got a big issue around understanding that emotional fear. And you know as well as I do, Nigel, in, in my constituency, it's people who've just retired who felt they had a certainty into the future, which has now been uh, shaken. You also talk about Putin, which I was absolutely uh, surprised by. But there again, we have this strong nationalistic leader who is there to fight the good fight. Um, to be frank, he is not wildly popular in Russia. And having worked in the Caucasus, I think that uh, allying yourself with Putin is a, how, oh, a little bit of a... No, 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 but it's about, it's, no, but it's about the values that, that you say uh, are being presented. Now, I would say that actually there is a defeatism in the narrative of UKIP. And the defeatism does actually permeate people's um, sort of psychological approach to, to politics. And that defeatism then pervades itself into the traditional parties. These parties cannot deliver. Now, I absolutely take responsibility that it is for us to make that case. I think we need to shine bright light, a strong sense of optimism to actually combat that defeatism. And I think we need to be absolutely clear that there is an end game. The end game is about a, a strong and bigger Britain, but it is not about uh, simplistic and very, very shallow policies that will not deliver for the people that you say that you do, uh, that you want to serve. Sam, thanks very much. Let's get the house lights up and let's get some questions going. And while I'm keeping an eye out um, for things, I just do just want to ask, you jumped on the Putin thing, and it may not be relevant for this particular no. thing, but you obviously didn't like it. Do you regret saying it? Well, I said it uh, just after Parliament had voted not to go to war in Syria, thank God. And I think that uh, one or two of the things that Putin said uh, did actually change the debate in this country. And I did make it perfectly clear. So I, don't, would, I don't like his Would you not say it now? Is that, I mean, you were saying you said it back then. Uh, well, it, it, it depends what you mean by the word. I said I don't like him, I wouldn't trust him, wouldn't want to live in his country, but compared to the kids that run foreign policy in this country, I've got more respect for him than our lot, yes. Okay. Uh, microphones. There's a microphone at the gentleman at the back there. We'll start there, and if you keep your hands up, then we can get the next one. We'll come to the gentleman in the corner here. Thanks, thanks uh, could you say, please, yeah. you know what I'm going to ask, keep the question short, tell us who you are, um, and we'll try and bounce through quite a lot of topics in the next 30 minutes. Sunder Katwala from the think tank British Future. I was very interested by Joe's slide that showed that the rise and rise of UKIP and Nigel Farage is actually seems to have closed the gap on the in-out question in that the outs were ahead all the way through the last two years and it, it now seems to be neck and neck between the ins and the outs. The ins are coming back. I wondered what you thought was going on there. And I, I noticed in the le most recent poll, the over 60s would get out of your but for everyone who isn't over 60 currently wouldn't. So does UKIP have a problem with people who don't remember Britain outside the European Union, who were born, who cast their first vote after 1972? Um, do you want to actually before you do you want to give us tell us the polling on that first of all? Uh, yeah, I mean the the most recent uh, the most recent polling essentially shows things neck and neck um, uh, in terms of uh, in on terms in of, out of the EU. Actually, I have the precise uh, I have the precise figures here if you're particularly uh, if you're particularly interested. Um, but uh, uh, it would it's 42 percent would vote to remain in the EU, 36 percent to leave. But it's fluctuating around the sort of 38 38 point. And is it possible to pick apart the age of who's voting? It's certainly, it's certainly possible to say that younger people are more pro-EU, uh, older people tend to be anti-EU. But the, the crucial point I would make is it's actually not about the in-out question, uh, to my mind. 
Instead, what it's about is what I would characterise as the in-out, shake-it-all-about question. Uh, when you give people the option of do you just want to leave or do you want to stay, then you get this result. If you ask people do you want to leave completely, do you want to stay or do you want a renegotiation, then a majority of people, over half the British people, say that they would like some form of renegotiation. Now, of course, the format that that renegotiation takes is very much up for debate and what satisfies one person will not satisfy another. But there is this, uh, there is this desire for renegotiation far stronger than a desire for leaving in the polls at the moment. Okay. Um, Nigel Farage, what's your, what's your answer? To I think there are some very strong similarities uh, between these opinion polls now and what we saw with the euro in the late 1990s and heading into sort of 2001, 2002. If you remember, it was 50-50. Should Britain join the euro or not, it was 50-50. Uh, we then had a big national debate, and there was a huge change um, of opinion, uh, and that change of opinion included not just the older voters, but the younger voters too. We haven't had a debate about the European question, but, uh, so and, we're now, and we're now beginning to have it. So, okay. so, we... so I, think that, I think most young people have not been exposed to a different argument, um, and I think... Once they are, there'll be more of them that say we shouldn't be there. OK, so you're old white men now, but you won't be once you've had the debate. Well, we, we, you know, we were a p party of high Tories and very, very middle class. As we've expanded, our expansion amongst working class voters has now overwhelmed that middle class support. Um, and I think the two areas that we're doing badly in... One, we're doing bad. You know, we're not doing as well with young people. We're not doing. We're not doing as well with women. But there's no reason to think that that can't change. Uh, can I just ask? Do you know why you're not? What's your belief as to why you're not attracting young people and women, actually? Well, so the women question's easy because if you actually look at the representatives of UKIP and some of the things they've said, it it, it okay. has looked to be repugnant to women. That will change. <laughs> that will change. That will change on May the 25th, when pro rata will have more women elected than any other party. Um, in the European Parliament, and it's happened without any positive discrimination, without any all-female shortlist. It's happened because the party itself is changing. Laura Sands. I mean, I think your, your party is quite well controlled from the centre, so I'm sure there has been some design in this. But, I mean, it is about the shrillness of, 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 of the party that does put certain people off. I mean, let's be frank. This is an important minority party. It is not the majority of public opinion. Um, that vote UKIP. Now, on the EU issue, I had an extraordinary experience. Fishermen are not necessarily considered the most pro-EU uh, group of constituency. And I was talking to them about Europe, and they were sort of saying, well, you know, we must get out, etc. I said, where do you sell your fish again? And they said, Boulogne. I said, wow, now you're going to give me a really hard job, aren't you, as your Member of Parliament, because I'm going to have to negotiate with the Mayor of Boulogne that you can sell your fish in, in, in <sighs> France. And I said, I didn't realise that. What, you mean we wouldn't be able to sell our fish in France if we came out of the EU? I said, that is the implication. And we, as pro-Europeans, have not actually I made... Mean, have I mean, not actually that made comical, that. isn't it? No, I mean, that it's really not. is... That, I mean, you, you, it's... That, there is they no will, way. But they there is can no way. Sell you, their... Your fishermen know more about the real world than you do. No, um, and, 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 they, not. and they damn well know that that a country like the United Kingdom, which is now the Eurozone's biggest export market in the world, with whom there is an annual trade deficit Absolutely running at fifty not. billion sterling a year, and given that only Belarus and the Ukraine within the European time zone, haven't got some kind of free trade deal with the European Union. They know the that we'll go on buying... The idea that French fishermen are going to allow British fishermen to sell uh, fish in Boulogne, I assure you, I think is, Laura, is quite I, an exaggeration. I, I just don't know what Let's planet you're on. Business get on another goes question. on anyway. No, so that we can get through some more questions. The gentleman over there. Um, thank you. Uh, Sean Curtin, um, uh, Chatham House member. I, I want to go back to uh, women, um, particularly on the elderly. Is it just a white old men? There aren't any white old women who've suffered a similar displacement that are supporters of UKIP is one of the points I wanted to make. And the other one is just basically that Nigel, as a political leader, seems to stand out. My 11-year-old son has recently done a project on political leaders and one of the problems he had was he kept mixing up Nick Clegg and Ed Miliband and David Cameron. And I hadn't thought about it before as someone who's immersed in politics, but they do seem to be quite similar and offering a similar message. So I presume that for uh, voters who are not so well engaged in politics that it is difficult to distinguish between the three major parties. And this is also a factor in Nigel's uh, popularity. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do you want to... Yeah, I mean, on the, the gender gap, I mean... 
you know, it's, it's, it's quite clear that uh, not only UKIP but also other radical right-wing parties in Europe have this problem, and there are various reasons as to why that is the case. One is, as uh, Nigel has said, because of the statements of some of their candidates. But more than that, I think it's slightly deeper in that generally women tend to be less attracted to parties that uh, you know, are, are seen as being heavily nationalist and also at times not seen as being a credible option at, at big first order elections. But that brings me into your second point, which is you know, that what are the challenges facing UKIP? I mean, one is that institutional um, problem. You know, we, we, we look at all you know, top seats for UKIP in 2015, right? And, and the idea of UKIP representation <coughs> in Westminster, it's gonna be very, very difficult for the party. It's not completely beyond the realms of possibility, but it is gonna be very, very difficult. Um, how is the party going to navigate that first pass the post system? Um, led by Nigel, but, but, but secondly, the second challenge, um, and I guess I refer this um, back to Nigel, is, is what happens after you stand down? Because so much of this seems to stand on your shoulders. I mean, well, I what? Won't, I probably won't, won't stand down. I'll probably get killed in some crash, as I've had several in my life so far. Um, no, I mean, look, um, I. I've never wanted UKIP to be a one-man band. I'm not some maniac egotist that has to do every TV interview or far from it. And I'm very pleased we have got some new talent coming into the party. And you'll notice, if you look at the airwaves over the last month or so, uh, I've done very little. I'm trying to bring new people on. I think the election, uh, the election of uh, a whole raft of women with some very different backgrounds, you who know, business you backgrounds. Who should we all be looking at? Well, I think, for example, Diane James, who stood for us in the Eastley by-election, you know, has become established as a, as a figure okay. that's appeared on the Today programme, whatever. I think there are people like uh, Margot Parker, who's going to get elected for us in the East Midlands, who's, you know, a steel worker's daughter, small businesswoman, actually done rather well in life. People like this, who've got real life experiences of run businesses, bring up families, I think actually, you know, they're going to start to help to, us to reach a different but bigger audience. Okay, and what... what can I just ask, post-2017, because it's one thing post-Nigel Farage, post-2017, assuming that there is a referendum, well, uh, what, what happens to you? Yeah, but I mean, that's the, I mean, you know, that's the key, isn't it? I mean, we are going to be spending the, the bulk of our money in the next eight weeks in the big Midlands and northern cities targeting the <coughs> Labour vote. I think that Conservatives who are going to vote for UKIP or even lend their vote to, to UKIP on May the 22nd, who live in Dorset, have made their minds up already. I think it is in those big cities that if we're, if we're to, I mean, we saw the polling earlier, if we're to overhaul the Labour Party and win those European elections and strike a body blow to Miliband in terms of his credibility as a winner, we'll do it in the Midlands and Northern cities. And I think if we do that, then there's every reason to think that Labour will match Cameron's promise of a referendum. So, so, you know, I think to think there'll be a referendum in 2017 because Cameron's going to get a majority next year okay. looks pretty unlikely. Okay, but say, say you're successful with that and mm. there is a referendum. Mm. In a sense, whichever way it votes, what's the point of UKIP afterwards? Well, I think the fact that we're actually uh, picking up voters on issues that are not directly related to the constitutional question perhaps answers that question. Yeah. And if you look at the English county elections last year, you know, people voted for us, not on the European question, but for all those local issues, everything from the lunacy of wind turbines through to the belief that grammar schools would actually benefit people uh, from the working classes. Laura. I mean, I mean, I think when you're talking about women's vote, I mean, think the issue is the economy, it is health, it is education. I cannot articulate any UKIP strategies, any UKIP policies on those issues. And those are the top line issues that will determine the general election. And we've got to be absolutely clear about it. But I think we also have to learn from UKIP, and that is this is not just a transactional relationship. There has to be values that underpin each of the main political parties that are articulated effectively and actually engage the public in a way that is believable and long-term. Question here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Henry Govagarnias and I've got a past in uh, working with the Danish Eurosceptic movements. Uh, I just, it's interesting for me to, obviously I've been in this country for a number of years now, uh, that the Eurosceptic vote seems to come from the right, where you see in Scandinavia, mm. the Eurosceptic vote definitely uh, emanates from the left. So the idea that certainly you get uh, people on the left voting for UKIP is no surprise to anybody who's used to Scandinavia. Uh, that, is, that is the common thing there. Uh, and, and I 
would expect it to, to continue, but, but would like your comments on that. The second thing is that I know that I'm old, I'm white, and I'm male, uh, but I also do feel left behind in this whole uh, European issue because the vast majority of the political decisions are taken uh, amongst 450 million people speaking 15 different languages and by a president who I can't understand. I don't understand his language, and I would expect that the British public, if you ask them, less than 1% would be able to tell you his name. So the idea that you are feeling left behind is not just the people that feel that, that the economic crisis has hit them. It is actually people who would like to have an influence on what happens politically in this country. Okay. And that's exactly what core UKIP voters are saying uh, when, when we surveyed them, that people like me have no say in government. And when you look at the stats, you know, that's, that's certainly um, something that we need to think about. And in Parliament today, only 4%. Uh, of MPs have experience of manual work. That's down from 16% in, in the time of Thatcher. They were never a majority, but they are you know, almost an extinct species now. Um, you know, and th these are big challenges, representativeness. And you know, Rob and I have written something over the last couple of days on you know, the selection of Stephen Kinnock within the Labour Party is an example of that, somebody who has flown into a safe Labour seat, who has very little connection with local voters, who spends his time b b you know, between Geneva and... Um, uh, you know, the World Economic Forum and Brussels. And, and these are big questions for the left, and that relates to your first question. How are centre-left governments, not only in Britain, but <coughs> centre-left parties, going to deal with these radical right revolts? Because they, their appeal is strongest, not among right-wing voters. Their appeal is strongest among centre-left blue-collar workers who are already instinctively Eurosceptic and hostile Absolutely. to immigration and anxious and insecure. And I think a big reason why that is the case is because the centre-left, for obvious reasons, is still very reluctant to open up a conversation with those voters about values and identity and community. Instead, it, it, it structures its narrative far too much along the lines of economics and finance. And these voters want to have a much deeper conversation than that. Mm -hmm. Really difficult for the left. I want to know, Farage, when you're described as radical right, are you quite happy with that tag? Oh, we're radical all right. I mean, we are, I tell you what, we are... are you quite are, happy to work with whomever we are, we are so on extreme, the left. Sarah. We are so extreme. That, and, and this may shock, particularly Laura, would be very shocked by this concept. Uh, we actually don't want to be governed by Herman Van Rompuy and 28 unelected bureaucrats in Brussels. We want Britain to be a self-governing, independent nation, proud of who it is, uh, and, and where voters are connected okay. directly to the destiny of our country. I have never regarded... I have never... I mean, I left business but, 20 years ago okay. to get involved in this, and I have never regarded our agenda as being radical or extreme. Okay, but Just you know, I plain interviewed somebody from the, na from the Front National well, in well, France well, the other day. Well, no, I'm not interested. But, no, but... Well, I'm not interested. Wait, wait. Okay. Everybody else might be interested, well, so I'm going to ask the question. You know, There's a classic Which BBC, is isn't it? You try and no. link me with the Front National. I'm not. And you try no, and do it, and you will do it. with you. Well, I couldn't give a damn. I'm not interested. I heard the man in question. His name is Bruno Golnish. He'll tell you within the first five minutes of meeting him that Auschwitz is all a complete fabrication. I am not doing business with the Front National in any way at all. And that period, that's okay. it. Will you do business with the, those on the left in, the, in Scandinavia? Of course, and I have done in the past. And I've sat with, I've sat in the European Parliament with Danish left-wing groups before. Absolutely. Okay. A question from the lady here with the glasses. Hello, uh, Georgia Graham from The Telegraph. Um, it's a similar uh, question, but... I would be more interested in whether you feel that your voters or people who are considering voting UKIP will have anything in common with the people that voted for FN. So not whether you would do business with them, but whether your voters have similar concerns and what you feel about that, because that is quite a key issue. Yeah. Well, I'm not standing in France. I had thought about it, but no, I'm but not. You, but it's um, interesting. You cleared, I, you cleared up your I, candidates. So I, could you, would you, do you want I, to clear out some of your voters? Well, the point is this. The... For some years, we had a... I mean, this book deals... By the way, this book deals with this question beautifully. There is, there is a chapter in there about what happened within UKIP in 2008 in terms of the direction that the party very consciously chose to take. Um, and we absolutely... You know, I mean, I, I changed... It. I even changed the constitution of the party. So we're the only UK political party now. I mean, if, you know, if you're an ex-BMP... In fact, the Tories have got an ex-BMP guy standing for them in a by-election in Lincolnshire uh, later on uh, this month... We wouldn't allow that, so I've absolutely made it clear. We want no truck with the BMP types at all. But your question, I think you meant BMP voters, not FN voters. What we did 
What we did, starting with the Oldham by-election in the north of England, is to, for the first time ever, try and deal with the BNP question by going out and saying to BNP voters, if you're voting BNP because you're frustrated, upset with the change in your community, but you're doing it holding your nose because you don't agree with their racist agenda, come and vote for us. And I would think that we've probably taken a third of the BNP vote directly from them. Um, and I don't think anyone's done more, apart from Nick Griffin on Question Time, but I don't think anyone's done more to damage the BNP than UKIP, and I'm quite proud of that. Okay. A question here. Sulaf Anashawati, member of Chatham House. Um, right now, um, how relevant is the EU question to the majority of British people who are struggling to make ends meet on a daily basis? And what does UKIP have to offer apart from massaging the egos of proud English men playing on their nostalgic emotions and insecurities? Before you answer that question, can we get the polling, Joe? Yeah, if you, if you ask people well, what's the most important issue facing the country uh, and you give them a list of options and you ask them to pick their top three, around about one in seven people chooses to mention Europe. Uh, among UKIP supporters, that is slightly higher, but it's by no means overwhelming. And then when you, uh, when you expand the question and say, well, what's the most important issue facing you and your family? Then around about one in 13 people says it. So it's just not a, uh, it's not a big <coughs> issue. It's not a big, uh, it's not a big thing for people. Even in the run-up to European elections, it never <coughs> really suddenly skyrockets. Instead, what's more important to people are the issues that, uh, that have been discussed, and particularly for, for UKIP supporters, it's things like welfare, it's things like benefits, and it's things like immigration. Okay, just, and just one other thought. Sunda Katwala, I think, has got something coming out. Br British future, future British or something, where, where they are, he, he, he makes the point that actually, it's, UKIP's doing fabulously, but wait till the general election, that vote will disappear. What's the evidence when you look back? Is there? Just come in on that, because that, that is it's the ultimate test for UKIP. How do you get over the first past the post system? And the Conservatives have latched onto this narrative that we'll take a hit at the European Parliament elections and then we will come out gunning with vote UKIP, get a Labour government. You know, and, 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 and the sort of ob objectives behind that are relatively clear to, to, to in essence, get, um, you know, fr frighten UKIP voters uh, sort of back into the Conservative camp. There are two problems with that from a party strategy perspective. One is obviously not all UKIP voters are Conservatives. Many of the people who we polled would simply not go back to the Conservatives or might not even go back to any party in Westminster. So that's a big problem. But secondly, Lord Ashcroft's polling this week I mean, showed quite convincingly that only one out of every 10 Conservative, sorry, only one out of every 10 UKIP voter um, would, would both believe that narrative and let it influence their vote choice. So as we go into 2015, you know, there really is um, a lot of unknowns about where these UKIP voters are going to go, how you could bring them back into the fold of mainstream politics. You know, whether they are so dissatisfied they're just going to go out anyway and say, you know, to hell with the institutional context, I'm going to vote expressively. So, you know, lots of open questions because we've never been here since the 1980s with the SDP. Historically, it has always fallen back. But it's yeah. never been historically this high. Yeah, I think we get this wrong, you see. I mean, it's, it's interesting. All the panels say, well, because Europe doesn't really matter to people. And it goes back to your question. Well, if you ask people uh, what matters to you, getting a job or Article 127 of the Treaty on European Union, you may find jobs are more popular. Um, uh, but, of course, what nobody understands in Westminster or amongst the commentariat is the penny has dropped. The great British public now know that wage compression and youth unemployment are directly linked to the wholly irresponsible, stupid policy of having an unconditional open door to 485 million people. Um, I think we've got to look at the European issue as something that, as I say, is euphemistically for being out of control, not feeling that you've got well, the hands on the political, uh, political levers. I, I mean, I'm not disagreeing in many ways. But the issue of how to address this, and particularly when we start to talk about migration, actually, the policies that are in place are dealing with migration are actually nothing to do with numbers in, numbers out. It's to do with welfare reform, which actually is yeah. moving people back into work. Nothing to do with and it. secondly, is education. We've been let down quite significantly um, on our skills and on our educational achievement, and that has created skills gaps. Well, this is not a short-term thing. 
I would love to find out what the world looks like if we come out of the EU and we get rid of every single migrant out of this country. It is not going to solve the problem. Okay. Can, can you just, I know it's a, it's a big ask Who suggested we do time. that? I mean, well, okay, what, what, what are you suggesting? How would I'm, you, suggest, how would the I, I'm suggesting work? we have an honest conversation with the British public. I thought Nick Clegg was a, pro, was, 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 was a supporter of the EU. And yet I found him in denial okay. last week, as I find Laura in denial. Okay. Let's have a conversation with the British people. Do we you, have an open door Nigel to 485 Farage's million world. people Nigel or not? Nigel Farage's Britain would, would be what? One where people cannot come here to work unless they have, I mean, you'd impose a sort of uh, a points quota. A work permit system, and I wouldn't discriminate in favour of Romania against India. No, I think we need to have a, not just a control on quantity, but, a, but, but also a control on quality. And if that was, a, if, if British people overseas had to take a hit as a result of that, is that a price well, why that would they? Why would they? I mean, that's a ridiculous assertion, isn't it? We get all this, all this nonsense that comes out about the number of Brits that are in Europe. Actually, there are fewer than 400,000 British people working in Europe. And if you deal with the expansionist phase post-2004, there are only 42,000 Britons working in the A8 countries. You know, it's, we can have a sensible reciprocal system, but to have an open door, and the big risk, Sarah, is this. The Eurozone is in such desperate trouble that I think we're on the edge of the biggest migratory wave yet. Okay, I'm conscious we could keep going, but I would think we'd better get some more questions. Gentlemen here, and then if we can get the microphone to the gentleman at the back. Yes, uh, Rajiv Shah, Chatham House member. Now, I'm going to vote for Mr. Farage, and I'm not an old white man. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is very simple. It's, it can, I can sum it up in one line, you know. It's, it's getting a bit crowded around here. It's getting a bit crowded around here. When I came here to this country in the 70s, we used to sing hymns about a green and pleasant land, you know. And it's, that's not going to happen if every decade we have to build houses for two million more people. I mean, sorry, but I'm going to vote for him. Can I, Laura, do you want to come back? To, I, hang on to the microphone just for a second. What I'm fascinated about is how we get to a situation where we stop the migration and we start to so-called, we're not going to be reducing numbers because numbers will go up on the basis of our existing population. And on one hand, Nigel wants us to stop our open borders with, with Europe and start trading with the rest of the world, which is a fantastic objective to trade with the rest of the world. Why is it that we don't want both? Why is it that we don't want to be ambitious with our trade globally as well we as our both? EU? Why can't we have both in Nigel's world? No, because the point with it is that we're going to end up, a bit like Norway, ending up having our regulations faxed to us. We're not going to have our voice, our business's Loss voice, round the, yeah. round the table. Norway, can I answer that? No, no, no. Wouldn't it be dreadful? No, but absolutely. <laughs> well, be real. The point is, Nigel, the issue... That's all right. I can no, hold on that. a second. But Norway I... complains about loss of control. No, Norwegian... But, but... No, 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 no. Norwegian politicians. Don't forget, this, is, this, is, no. this argument it's... of people versus the political class is going on today in Switzerland and in why, Norway as well. Why because do you want to trade Korea power in Europe with power in the rest of the world? Because, why don't you want it all? I want, I want Britain, it both because I'm a bit greedier for Britain than you. I want Britain to have, a, Britain have, a, Britain have a global okay. voice and to think that when the World we Trade Organization meets to discuss global trade, the British representatives are shown the door and we're banned from even being well, in the room, shows you we're losing global influence and not gaining not it. Not okay. Gentlemen at the back. Thank you, Sarah. And Nigel Farage in his opening, sorry, Robert Gardner, I'm a member of Chatham House. Ni Nigel Farage in his opening address mentioned the disparity of wealth across Europe as one of the um, tenets of his thinking. Um, if UKIP gets its way, what is next? And as we've seen a changing shape of Britain over the last centuries, um, what are your thoughts on the disparity of wealth in the UK? And this isn't just a Scottish question, I mean uh, across, the UK, across well, England as well. Well, I think this, in, in a sense, links to what this book's all about. You know, it is that growing gap between the aspirations of the wealthy and the realities of the poorer uh, that, that I think in many ways has created the environment that has allowed UKIP to flourish. Let's face it, the 7% of people who go to the private public schools, call them what you will, are now dominating our national life in a way we've never seen before. We see it not just in politics, not just in uh, the media, not just in the arts. We even see you know, over half our Olympic gold medal winners went to that 7% of schools. And we've seen the opportunities 
for those lower down the social spectrum, uh, frankly, they've sunk lower and lower. Uh, and I think, and Laura mentioned education, and I agree totally, we have got a failing education system for too many of our young people. So I think that's where UKIP actually appeals to the aspirational blue-collar voter by saying things like the opportunity of a grammar school education should be afforded to everybody. You, you seem to recognise, I mean, that the, in large part it's, it is the left <coughs> behind, that you are... I use the word protest vote, but I know, and I know you won't like it, but people are unhappy with everything else. Yeah. That's part of it. You put it down to disenchantment. Are you, in terms of running your party, somewhat concerned <coughs> about how you keep all these people in with you over years? Oh, I'm very concerned. Of course I am. You know, keeping any political party together is difficult because you've always got different support bases that come from different wings. But I think the protest vote thing is very interesting. Um, the first time I really heard this was the morning after the Eastley by-election on your programme that, you know, big protest vote for UKIP. And I went down the high street in Eastleigh, and people came up to me and said, Mr Farage, we're not protest voters. We haven't voted for 20 years. We voted for you yesterday because you, you actually stand for the values that we believe in. So I think it's very interesting. Over one in five of our votes comes from people who would be de deemed to be non-voters. And almost by definition, that can't be a protest. OK, look, we're up against it time-wise, so I'm sorry about questions. Can I just have a thought? Do you reckon um, UKIP's going to be around in 10 years' time as a st strong force that we're all going to be... Uh... Well, I think What's your call? I want each of you on this, so don't think you're going to get call. off the hook, and, we'll, and then we'll end it. Well, I, I, I mean, if it is, Rob and I can come back and write another book, and we're going <laughs> to e e e explain, explain why it is. Um, even if UKIP isn't, the, the, the point behind this debate is that the divisions that we're picking up, the divisions that have opened up and have grown since the crisis, are going to be with us. And in one form or another, um, we will have this... Uh, uh, struggling, disadvantaged, low educated, low skilled group of voters who feel completely cut out of our political conversation and disconnected from mainstream life. Where are they going to go? Are they going to stay at home, give up on democratic politics altogether, or are they going to stay loyal to a party like UKIP or its successor? The key question I think facing those in politics is how you you know, what do you do about those divisions within our society that are also within every other West European democracy, which is why we're seeing very similar trends in terms of party competition. I mean, that is where the real question, the real debate is, I think. I think it depends on what you mean by strong. Uh, will they have, uh, will they have sit, sit, seats in Westminster? I'd be very surprised. Will they have uh, a bump around the European elections? Yes, I don't... You would don't... be very surprised if they had any seats in Westminster. Yes. Uh, I don't think... A bit, and uh, for, reasons that, uh, for reasons that have been discussed. Uh, okay. But I also don't think Britain will vote to leave Europe, and so I think there will always be a, uh, a place for Nigel and his, uh, and his party. <laughs> They'll always be in England. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think really we're also at a particular moment of a high point where we've got economic shocks, people are concerned about their future. And one of the other problems that we have is total lack of social mobility. And that is something that has to be, there has to be opportunity, optimism, and, and an end game that actually offers people the opportunity to, to, to move on and up and all the rest of it. And we've lost that. That's something that hopefully education, the economy recovering, will actually start to dilute some of this much, much more sort of visceral well, it, and You're suggesting emotional. we'll chip away at UKIP support? I think so, absolutely. Okay, how many MPs are you going to have in 10, minutes, 10 years' time? I, do you know, I actually think that in most things in life, the factor that nobody ever thinks about is luck. It's luck. And the Reform Party of Canada, you know, went all through the 80s, doing well in local government, not getting near a seat in Ottawa, being written off by the established media as being right-wing, radical, extreme, God knows what. And as luck would have it, there was a by-election one day way out west, and despite the fact they'd scored 3% there, just a few months before in the general election, a local school teacher stood, uh, and she won the by-election. And nobody could believe it, and she went as a sole member of parliament to okay. Ottawa, and in the next general election, they were the biggest party in Canadian okay. politics. So was Robert I don't know. just unlucky? Uh, no, you, no, 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 definitely not unlucky. Uh, I could use a different set of words about him, but I'm not going to. So how many MPs? I've no idea. I haven't got a clue. But if, it's going to be we... hard to get one, isn't it? Uh, well, as I said to you, it's about luck. The Eastley by-election came along, and we came up on the rails as a very fast horse and almost <laughs> overtook the Lib Dems. And as Ashdown said, another week longer, UKIP would have won it. Let's wait and see. I've no idea. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Nigel Farage, Laura Sands, Joe Twyman and Dr Matthew Goodman. <laughs>